I went to school less often barefoot than the poor people did. It meant that I had sandals for most part of the year, and I had one cap. No toys and no time to play with toys. It was a tough place, and you have to be tough to survive there. And my father was one. He was tough, he was influential, he was a tribal leader, and he was a dominant figure at home. I was also blessed with having several siblings from my stepmothers before I came to this world. So growing up in that family with a dominant father and several siblings who wanted to boss me around, I grew up to be very shy and timid. I was afraid of using a gun until I was 14. And my father nicknamed me the weakling of the family. It was a place where education was considered not a blessing, but a curse. So much so that the government had to impose quotas on villages in the area that every year they had to send so many kids to school. My father was an exception to that rule. He, had, he was blessed, or what I can say, cursed to have three years of schooling because that's all that was available at his time. But he educated himself and was extremely knowledgeable and influential socially. However, his social influence did not translate into material wealth. His money thermostat was set at very low, and through some business transactions, he lost most of his possessions, and the small piece of land that he grew crops to provide food for us was mortgaged. At harvest times, the lenders will come and take all the good crops, and we'll be left with the leftovers to success. This was the time when I was, became six years old, and I was selected to go to school as part of the quota system. The villagers had to collect money and give it to my father, so their children will be spared the curse of education. <laughs> because I was shy and timid, I could not speak in front of adults, and I was afraid of authority figures. But what that helped me was to learn how to listen. And listen, I did a lot. Sometimes I listened to a lot of nonsense. When I went to school, the advantage was that I listened to the teachers and I excelled academically. I even skipped some classes to go to an upper class. It was much later in my 40s here in Canada when I found out that perhaps, perhaps I was a gifted child with a lot of imagination. It was at that time, with that power in our home, that I came up with a dream and a strong belief in the Almighty God that when you pray, He will respond. When I will come from school, I will run away from home to a nearby creek and hide in the bushes instead of doing domestic chores and grazing animals outside. Sometimes I will pick a pebble from the creek the size of a walnut and put it in my pocket. At night, when I will sleep, I will pray that in the morning when I wake up, it will not be a stone. Most people will think that I wanted it to be gold in the morning, but no, no. I had a bigger imagination. I wanted it to be a box that I can hold in one hand with a handle that I turn around and money that I need comes out of the other side. <laughs> I did this many times, but the money machine never showed up. A lot of other dreams were materialized and a lot of other things showed up. 
I finished school, I went to university, I got an eight year scholarship to study in the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. I became an architect, I got my MBA, and then had a good job of architecture in Lebanon, but the war started. Afghanistan was invaded by the Soviet Union, and I ended up in Canada in 1985. My parents became refugees in a neighboring country. Here in Canada, I also found a good job in architecture. As a matter of fact, I worked on very iconic projects. Just one of them to tell you, I was the project manager for the Waterloo Courthouse, which is located in Kitchener at Frederick and Weber. I sponsored my parents and brothers and sisters to come to Canada. I got married. I, had, I have two children, two boys, very handsome and sexy. As a matter of fact, one of them is sitting over there to cheer me up. <laughs> and I had a happy life. Then in 2006, something strange happened. I went to a program called the Passion Test. And the passion test is a program that shows you what your top five passions are. I thought that I already know what my passions were. But when I went through that program, I discovered that my number one passion didn't make it to the top five. But that is a completely different story for another moment. What I learned in the passion test was the concept of manifestation and the idea of intention attention and no tension. What I learned was that in order for you to manifest something, you have to set an intention and then focus your attention on it and then let the universe deliver it to you. Sometimes the way you envision it, sometimes it may be different. If it is different, then you should not have any tension and accept it. When I was contemplating my life in the light of this new knowledge, I found out that whatever I needed and wanted have somehow been manifested, including the money machine. <laughs> Some of you, maybe one or two of you may remember in, in six, seven decades ago, the telephone apparatus was like a big box where you raise the handset the headset and then you dial and there will be a switchboard with an operator and you will tell them that you want to talk to that person. So they will take your, put it in a switchboard and the other one and you will be connected. Then the rotary phone came, replaced the, the older one and then came with the buttons, you press the buttons. And now with the wireless touch that we carry with us all the time. Now, the money machine manifested itself not as the machine I had imagined with a handle, but as an instant teller machine. <laughs> I was blessed that whenever I needed money here in Canada, I just put my card there, <laughs> put some numbers, and tell them this much money I need, and the money will come out. <laughs> Six years ago, I was chatting with a, an Afghan Canadian who was working in the Supreme Court of Afghanistan in Kabul. He told me that he was coming to Canada in the next few days if I needed anything. I told him, no, thank you. As customary, I told him, I want you to come safe with all your faculties intact. And I said goodbye. And then immediately something, something lit in my head and I contacted him again. I said, yes, I want you to bring me something. I want you to go to Kabul River and, and pick a pebble the size of a walnut and bring it to me. He was surprised why I would like to have that. I told him that when you come here, I will tell you my childhood story. But a few days later, he did, and so did I. And what happened was, he did bring me that stone, and I carry it all the time in my pocket to keep
keep me grounded in gratitude and to remind me to let the dream be the driver. Thank you very much.